We're going to go to John chapter 1. Back to John chapter 1, and then of course we're going to be over in Revelation. We're going to go back and start again at John chapter 1. We're continuing this series on familiar passages rightly divided. And uh, of course here we are, it's the, the week, I haven't said anything about it, but it's the week of of uh, Easter, what's called Easter week, the week, of, the week of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We've talked uh, scripturally through that over the years, and it's been a while, maybe I need to pick up on that sometime in the next year or so, but uh, you go through, and uh, next Friday is going to be called by the church world, Good Friday. Uh, but there is no way that you can do the math and get uh, three days and three nights from Friday night to Sunday morning. It just, there ain't no way. And uh, I hold to a Wednesday crucifixion. There are some others that are good to go that I won't fight too much that hold to a Thursday crucifixion. But one thing's for sure, it cannot be a Friday crucifixion. And so uh, we have that in mind. Of course, next Sunday is called Easter Sunday. I like to refer to it as Resurrection Sunday. And there's some, uh, and this is rambling a little bit, there's some uh, uh, good solid arguments about the word Easter and what it means. Brian Ross has a good uh, series that he did up on the use of the word Easter in, in uh, Acts chapter 4, I think it is, and a good argument, but in spite of all that, when we think of Easter and all those, uh, uh, all of the traditions that surround Easter, uh, whether Easter in, in Acts four is a reference to Astarte or or Estar or not, uh, all the celebrations around Easter with an Easter bunny and an Easter egg and uh, you know ham for lunch and all all of that goes back to. Uh, Astarte or Estar or whatever. So it's just, there it is. That's just the truth of it. So we're entering that season. Uh, a lot of uh, a, a lot of tradition that goes with that. Uh, uh, we don't do Easter egg hunts. I don't. If you do, that's fine. I just don't. And, uh, and so there it is. All right. But uh, anyway, what I want us to focus on, Debbie and I were talking about this yesterday. I can remember... As a little fellow growing up, uh, Easter meant the first trip to the zoo in Tulsa, to Mohawk Park. Hmm. And uh, so that was, the, we. if we had not been all winter, we went to Mohawk Park uh, and the Mohawk Zoo uh, at Easter time. Uh, we got new clothes and uh, new shoes. And of course, you got an Easter basket and uh, all that kind of stuff. You know, I, I can remember all that about Easter growing up. I can remember making Easter eggs and coloring eggs and all that. I wonder how we never got sick from eating those boiled <laughs> eggs that had been laying out, you know. Uh, but uh, And you keep those boiled eggs for two or three days, and Tuesday you're still eating boiled eggs and you hadn't kept them in the refrigerator. It's a wonder we didn't get sick. Uh, but, you know, growing up, I, I don't remember anything about the resurrection of Christ. I remember going to Mohawk Park. I remember getting new shoes. I remember, you know, all that stuff. But I don't remember anything about the resurrection of Christ because Easter was about Easter bunny, Easter baskets, and new clothes, and going to the zoo. Uh, so for me, I want us to keep focused on what is the Resurrection Sunday all about. Now, we preach the resurrection every Sunday. We don't wait till one time of the year. Uh, but just be mindful and, uh, and it's kind of like Christmas time. Uh, we know that Jesus was conceived at Christmas time. He wasn't born at Christmas time. Uh, but we use the Christmas season as an opportunity to uh, use that to share the gospel and talk to folks. So you can do the same thing at Easter. Use the Easter season as an opportunity to talk to folks about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So be mindful of that this week. Well, with all that being said, it's interesting where we are, and it just happens to be around this time, but we're in John chapter 1. We began this last time, 
and we're going to uh, carry it a little farther today and, and see if we can't get through at least hitting those references and move right along. But in John chapter 1, and we pointed out last week that this is uh, the gospel according to John. It's written by the Apostle John. It's written by the same, same man who wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John in Revelation. Um, and as he's writing this, he's recording, here we are in John chapter 1, as we go into verse 29 and where we're headed here, uh, he's recording, John the Apostle is recording the words of John the Baptist. And as we looked at it last week, we're at verse 29 of John chapter 1, and he said, The next day John, that's John the Baptist, seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now, as John being a forerunner of Christ, and John, uh, John the Baptist being a forerunner of Christ, John the Baptist coming in fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 40, is it certainly possible that John had some view of the cross or some understanding of Isaiah 53 in those places? Well, I think that he probably did have some view of that. But I think as John the Baptist is looking at Jesus coming and he, and he sees him there and he says, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. I think he's looking through that and John the Revelator, John the Apostle records this. I, I think he's looking through that to that role that the Lamb will have out there in the future uh, in the tribulation uh, time. And, and the reason I say that is because of the proper noun, the proper use of the word lamb with a capital L. The only, t the only place we see Jesus referred to as the lamb with a capital L is here in John chapter 1 and then over there in Revelation. I don't think that's an accident. I think that's by design. I think God did that. And I think he ties those things together on purpose. And so when we look at, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world, verse 29. We walk through verses, uh, uh, down through about verse 34 or so, and we talked about why was Jesus baptized. He was baptized to be made manifest to the nation of Israel. Now go on with me to verse 35 of John chapter 1. And look with me there. It says, Again the next day after John stood and two of his disciples. So this is the day after the baptism of Jesus. And so that next day, here's John. Of course, again, we're John the Baptist and two of John the Baptist's disciples. And I hadn't paid attention to this till I was reading through this this morning. And looking upon Jesus, he walked. As he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. So this is the second time now that John the Baptist has made a reference to Jesus as the Lamb of God, with a capital L. Verse 32. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. So you got two disciples that were disciples of John at verse 35. They hear John looking upon Jesus as he walked and saying, Behold the Lamb of God. And these two disciples who heard John say that about Jesus, they quit following John the Baptist and they began to follow Jesus. That's interesting. Well, we continue on down through here. Verse 38, Then Jesus turned and saw them following and saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. So that means it was about, what, four o'clock in the afternoon, the tenth hour of the day. Uh, verse 40, one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And so you've got Andrew and now Simon Peter, Peter, who have been following John the Baptist as John the Baptist's disciples. Jesus shows up. John the Baptist baptizes him, says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The next day, John sees Jesus again and says, Behold the Lamb of God. 
and Andrew and Simon Peter, Andrew and Peter stopped following John the Baptist and they began to follow Jesus. And so, again, that was interesting to me. Verse 41, he says that uh, when, when Andrew went to Simon, he said, we found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. I made reference to this several weeks ago, and, uh, and it ties in right here, that uh, uh, there was only one reference or one use of the word Messiah in the Old Testament, and it was used back there in Daniel chapter 9, where he gave, when we gave the 70th week of Daniel, or the, the 70 weeks upon the nation of Israel. And it said, uh, and he talked about the Messiah, and in those days of the Messiah, and when the Messiah is cut off. That's the only reference in the Old Testament using the word Messiah. And so, as, as they're following along, evidently they have some kind of a knowledge about this Messiah who was to come. Uh, and it had to go back to that direct reference to Daniel chapter 9. And so Andrew tells Peter, he says, we found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And so now we know whenever we read the Lord Jesus Christ or the Christ, then that is our basically the New Testament word, Christ, is the same as that Old Testament word, Messiah or Messiah. All right. Verse 42, and he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto them, saith unto him, We have found him, verse 45, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So you see how these guys, now these are just common fishermen, aren't they? But yet they had some kind of knowledge of the Messiah, the prophecy of Daniel. They had some kind of knowledge of the writing of Moses, because he says right there, uh, we found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Verse 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Verse 49 is where I'm headed here. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the king of Israel. Now I went through all that because I think that all then ties back into behold the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. And he's coming in here, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Now in Jesus in his earthly ministry, was he ever crowned the King of Israel? He never was. But is he going to be out there as the lamb in that book of Revelation. Indeed he is. Alright, so let's go now to Revelation and let's walk through some of these passages. What's he talking about? Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Sam, can you just imagine these, these guys, they're, they're finally realizing they, they, they discovered Christ and they, they've identified and they're, they're running around and telling each other and, yeah. and bringing them in. The excitement that they must have had. Well, time. sure, yeah, yeah. I mean, Andrew, hey, man, let, he, I'm going to go find my brother. And, and so you got Andrew and, and Peter, and then you find out, what is it, Nathaniel or Philip is from their same town, and Philip hears about this, and Philip goes and finds Nathaniel. And so the, this is the beginning of those 12 disciples, of those 12 apostles. This is when they're first when they're first called out. So, so yeah, think, great excitement. Do you think that the disciple that had been following John the Baptist that didn't, that wasn't Andrew, was that John? The two disciples? That had been following. I, Andrew went and found Peter. So who was the other one? Do you think it was John? I, I when I read through it, I just kind of, when, when I went through it, I thought it was Peter. I, took I read it, it. Well, Andrew Peter went and found, found Peter. Peter. Yeah, he, said, yeah. he went and found Peter. It, it, maybe it was. Uh, John the Apostle. 
Well, yeah. Dad or Lazarus wrote it, whoever wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not quite sure now. I'm just yeah. <laughs> no, I'm going to stick with John, okay? Uh, yeah, I think it was John. Yeah, let me let me go back and look at it and pay more attention to it there. Uh, you look at uh, verse, 40, the, verse 40. Yeah, one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Uh, he first find, find his own brother Simon said that we found the Messiah's. We could have been the other two, you know, him and the other one. It could have been. I mean, yeah. I, I never thought about it. I yeah, I, I, I'll be honest with you. I didn't go back and look. Probably a good idea to get an answer would be to go back and look at the other Gospels where they called the apostles and, and first gathered the 12, and that might give an answer to that. But uh, so my I, when I just breezed through it, I just said, well, it must be Peter was the second guy. But maybe it was John the Apostle. Uh uh, but at the same time, you got James and John, the two brothers, and I would think that they, would, you know, would come together. So I, I would have to go back and look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke and put all up together to come up with a proper answer for you. Uh, I, I was, I would say that it'd be fairly easy to find just by chasing out the calling of the twelve through the other gospels and putting it all together. All right, all right, now. Uh, Revelation chapter 5 and I think we hit this before we quit last week and we started with this and verse 1 and I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book, and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. There's that capital L. Stood a lamb as it had been slain. Looking back at the cross, right? The lamb, the lamb, a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And so you've got... Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, referenced by John the Baptist and recorded by John. And then you've got John writing in the book of Revelation out here in the future. You've got him talking about this Lamb who's going to stand up and be able to open this seven-sealed book. And as the, that seven-sealed book is open, and as each of those seven <laughs> seals are open, as you continue through the book of Revelation, then... God is using the outpouring of His wrath and the opening of these seals to do what? To take away the sin of the world. He's purging out this old world through the outpouring of this wrath, preparing the world for His second coming and the establishment of that earthly kingdom. Let's keep looking. I said we're at verse 6, we're at verse 8. And when He had taken the book... The four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials of odor, of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So who is he talking about here with these that are going to reign on the earth? As kings and priests, who is that? That's Israel. Now, let's back up here while I'm, while I'm here, because it will answer a question maybe that's been in the back of your mind. In verse 8, it talks about those four and twenty elders. Now, as I was going through school and as I was taught about this, uh, or maybe you can answer the question before I do, if you've been taught about Revelation, who were you taught that the four and twenty elders represented? Anybody? 
have an answer to that one? I'm looking for Dad there. Who were you taught the four and twenty elders were represented? Twelve disciples and the twelve of in the Old Testament. Patriarchs. That's what I've taught you. <laughs> But when we were in school, we were taught that the four and twenty elders was the church. When we were back in Bible college, they taught us that the four and twenty elders was the church. It represented the church. They never gave an explanation as to why that represented the church. But I seriously believe that the four and twenty elders, just like Dad said, represent, they represent Israel. And it's the, the four and twenty elders are the twelve apostles of Israel and the twelve patriarchs of Israel the 12 sons of Jacob. Now I believe that very strongly because that just makes sense, number one. Number two, when you get there, there at the end of the book of Revelation and that new Jerusalem comes down and it's got seven day, gates and seven, or excuse me, 12 gates and 12 foundations whose names are on the gates and on the foundations. The 12 apostles and the 12 patriarchs. So it just makes sense to me that the 12 apostles and the 12 patriarchs are the ones who make up this 4 and 20 elders that you see throughout the book of Revelation. And it also makes sense because it's these 4 and 20 elders that uh, are there who are singing this new song, verse, verse 9, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God, by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Of course, we know that Israel was dispersed. Israel is in dispersion now. But he redeems them and brings them all back in to go into that kingdom, verse 10, and has made us unto our God kings and priests. Now, folks, for us today, the body of Christ, we have never been promised to be kings and priests and to reign with Christ on the earth. That's always been a promise and a prophecy of Israel. Starting way back there with Moses in Exodus 19, all the way through, nation of kings and priests is always identified with the people of Israel. So when you put all that together, that's part of what tells me this 4 and 20 elders has to do with the 12 apostles and the 12 patriarchs of Israel. All right, now... We continue on, verse 11. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. That's a lot of angels, isn't it? All right. Saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing." See, all this has to do with the Lamb when He takes away the sin of the world and comes and establishes Himself as the King. Verse 13, And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that uh, are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto Him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. The four beasts said, Amen, and the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. And so we have this lamb that's going to open that seven sealed book. Now was this lamb slain and rose again? Yes, he was. But his role as the lamb, capital L, has to do with this position that he's taking to open up that seven sealed book and to start pouring out that wrath. All right. Go with me to chapter 6, verse 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. Come and see. Who, where else did we read come and see? Back here in John chapter 1, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Come and see. So here we have that phrase again, come and see. Interesting how those things just happen to come together. And so he begins to take us through and show us the opening of this first seal. And I'm not going through all that, but I'm just showing you here where we're talking about this lamb. Look at verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. So he's, he's opening these seals all down through here. The first one, and he's all the way now, he's down at verse 13. 
uh, the Lamb is opening now the sixth seal. I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sack sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. There's that capital L again. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Look across the page at chapter 7. Verse 9. And after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations and kindred and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and psalms in their hands. And cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. Drop down to verse 13. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. These folks who come out of the tribulation, what have they done? They've washed their robes and made them white. Where? In the blood of the Lamb. Alright, drop down to verse 17. Well, let's just read 15 into 17. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve Him day and night in His temple, and He that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them into living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. All this having to do with the Lamb, those that are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Chapter 12, verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night, and they overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Chapter 13, verse 8. 7 and 8. And it was given unto him, talking about the Antichrist here, it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of the life, book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Chapter 14, verse 1. And I looked, and behold, a lamb stood on the mount Sinai, and with him an hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And so again, the lamb, and he's now talking about the hundred and forty-four thousand. Look at verse fourteen. And I know I'm creating a lot of questions, but I'm just trying to hit these references about the lamb. And let's see, where am I headed? Uh, uh, ver yeah, verse uh, verse ten is where I'm going. Uh, wait a minute. Four. There we go. Verse four. These are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. This is talking about the hundred forty-four thousand. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And so we talk about that hundred forty-four thousand and their relationship to the Lamb. In the tribulation time, there's going to be two witnesses in Jerusalem. Moses and Elijah, I believe those two witnesses are. And then there's going to be 144,000 Jews. 12,000 out of each of the 12 tribes of Israel. These 144,000 are going to go out as missionaries around the world preaching that gospel of the kingdom. And so that's what he's talking about here. They're identified with the Lamb. Verse 4 said, These are they which follow the Lamb. Now we go again to 
verse 9 and 10. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. All about taking away the sin of the world. Verse 11, 12 says, uh, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus. Now chapter 15, drop into verse 3. Talk about those who are redeemed. It says, verse 3, And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Chapter 17, verse 14. This is talking about uh, uh, those who rise up to fight against. It says, verse 40, 14, these, are, these shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with Him are called and chosen and faithful. Again, the Lamb taking away the sin of the world. Look at chapter 19, verse 7. I'm rushing through here. Of course, Jesus comes back. In chapter 19, but we're dropping in on verse 7 right before we have him coming back on that white horse, verse 11. But chapter 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Look at verse, uh, we'll just keep on reading 8 and 9. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Now turn chapter 21, verse 9. We've come through the thousand year reign. We, we, we're fast forwarding a whole lot through those couple of chapters. Now verse 9. And there came unto me, of Revelation 21, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. So he talks about that bride, the Lamb's wife. It ought to be real clear, the bride, the Lamb's wife, is not us. Look at verse uh, 14. Talking about this new Jerusalem that comes down. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. So you got the twelve apostles. Let's go ahead and back up verse 12 so I can give you those twelve gates. Talk about this new Jerusalem. Verse 12. And it had a wall great and high and had twelve gates. And at the gates, twelve angels and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. So you've got the names of those twelve sons of Jacob. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And again, the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the land. That's where I get that twenty-four elders being the... 12 apostles and the 12 patriarchs of Israel. Drop down verse 22, continuing to talk about this new Jerusalem. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. The kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall be shut, well, shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. 
And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And then finally, I think chapter 22, verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of the water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And so we wrap it all up now here quickly. We've got John the Baptist, written by John the Apostle, recording, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And then we chase that use of the word Lamb quickly as we did, all the way through the book of the Revelation. And you end up with that new Jerusalem and the Lamb being there in that new Jerusalem. And when you get to that new Jerusalem, there is no sin in that thing. So once again, we have... Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And so I present to you when we talk about the Lamb of God in John chapter 1, I think he's looking through the cross on forward to this prophesied time when Jesus, who is the Christ, the King of Israel, isn't that what Nathaniel said there in John 1? when this Jesus, the Christ, the King of Israel, comes and conquers and takes away the sin of the world through that course of those seven seals being opened up, the wrath of God being poured out, and Him coming and conquering and establishing that reign, and then establishing that new Jerusalem out there in the future. Now maybe I've oversimplified it or rushed through it, and there's probably a lot of questions there, but I think that we, I hope that we've at least painted a picture so we can see that behold the Lamb, capital L, has a whole lot to do with more than just the cross. It has to do with his role as the Lamb when he opens up that seven sealed book and ends up as the Lamb being worshipped out there in that new Jerusalem. Everybody good? More confusing? Or was that helpful? Hope it was helpful. All right. No questions or comments. Maybe we're just numb with all that. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, Sam, in reference to Chris's question about who the other disciple was, um, what what I found here is that uh, we're talking about the the two disciples were disciples of John the Baptist, and, right? And and in past uh, scriptures as well, John the Apostle would refrain from mentioning himself even though he was present many times in whatever was going on and he was reporting and writing about. Sure. And so it's, it, it, it's uh, pretty much the point is made that because of that it seems that that was John the, the Apostle. The other disciple was, the was John the Apostle but he just didn't speak of himself. Exactly. Okay, and the other was, so John and Andrew. And Andrew. John and Andrew. Okay, so Andrew would have gone to get Peter, mm -hmm. and then John, evidently, apparently, we know he did, he went and got his brother James. And so that's good. Okay, good. That makes sense. All right, anything else we want to add there? Very good. Amen. Well, let's uh, have a word of prayer. We'll pick up next week with uh, John chapter 3.